everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you have never seen my face on your screen before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of jane clough she was a young woman and mother of one from the northwest of England who was tragically murdered in mid-2010. As soon as Jane was killed and an investigation was launched by the police, immediately they knew and everyone knew, all of Jane's friends and family knew who had done this to her, who was responsible for this crime. In fact, even Jane knew herself way before her murder, she had predicted that it was going to happen. She lived in fear that it was going to happen as she had been the victim of horrendous abuse at the hands of her killer for a long time before he eventually took her life in the most brutal way. But as completely devastating as this case is, there was something so positive to come out of it as Jane's parents made it their mission after her death to create a legacy in her name and make a change in the law so that it was safer for other victims of abuse. And I'm really, really looking forward to sharing with you some more information about their incredible work later on towards the end of the video. But just before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young woman and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, rape, sexual abuse, domestic abuse and mental and emotional abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back to the summer of 2010 in the seaside town of Blackpool which is located in the county of Lancashire in England. And this is Jane Clough. She was a 26-year-old woman who was born in Lancashire, so she had lived there her whole life. Jane was born in 1984 to parents John and Penny Clough, and she was one of three siblings. She had a brother called Pete and a sister called Louise. And the Clough family lived in a town called Nelson in Lancashire. That is where John and Penny decided to settle down and raise their kids. By the looks of it, Jane had a really, really happy, fun childhood. And I've got a quote here from her mother, Penny, and she described her daughter as being just a beautiful person. She grew up into such a lovely young girl and the kind of child that you're just so proud of. Jane always did very well in school growing up. She really enjoyed school. She enjoyed learning. She was very academic and hardworking. And when her school years came to an end, Jane decided that she wanted to study to become a nurse. That was the career path that she wanted to go down. She was actually following in her mum Penny's footsteps because Penny herself worked as a nurse. So Jane studied for her degree and by 22 years old she was fully qualified as a nurse and she eventually got a job working at the Blackpool Victoria Hospital and by all accounts she loved this job and of course she was just brilliant at being a nurse. She was so so kind and caring and so good with her patients. She was the kind of nurse that any aspiring nurse would want to be like. She got on really well with her colleagues. Her colleagues all loved her and a lot of her colleagues actually became more than that. They became her friends, including a man named Jonathan Vass. He was a couple of years older than Jane. I believe she was around like 22, 23 when they met and he was about four years older, around like 26, 27. He was originally from the county of Bedfordshire in the east of England. However, he had lived in Lancashire since the age of four and he started working at the Blackpool Victoria Hospital in May of 2007. He worked as an ambulance technician so he would go out on calls with paramedics in the ambulance and basically be on hand and give support to paramedics as they treated patients. Apparently he had quite a few other jobs before working as an ambulance technician. He was someone who would often go from job to job a lot. He also worked as a bouncer part-time which I imagine he was probably Probably quite good at because he was a very big man. He was very tall, very muscly, strong build. He spent a lot of his time in the gym lifting weights and stuff. His colleagues at the hospital described Jonathan as being a bit of a jokester. He would pull pranks and try to make people laugh a lot and I think 
think most of his colleagues just thought he was a bit foolish and amateurish and a tad unprofessional at times. But one colleague who really took a liking to Jonathan Vass was Jane. As soon as she met Jonathan, she really, really liked him. He made her laugh and she thought that he was really charming and they quickly became good friends. In fact, they didn't stay just friends for long. Both Jane and Jonathan soon developed feelings for one another and so they started dating. Jane fell head over heels for him. They decided to keep their relationship a bit of a secret for a little while. I believe in the first few months they decided not to tell their colleagues or anyone because it was so new and obviously they worked together so I guess maybe they didn't want it to be awkward for their other co-workers if perhaps it didn't work out but they did make it work and Jane seemed to be happy in the relationship. She eventually introduced Jonathan to her family, her parents John and Penny and to be quite honest John and Penny weren't really that keen on Jonathan Vass when they met him. There was just something about him that didn't sit right with them. They didn't get good vibes from him. They just thought that he came across as a bit of a liar, a compulsive liar, and a very arrogant man. He would tell Jane and her family these stories about himself and his life that you could just tell were not true at all. So for example, Jane's mother Penny said that Jonathan said that he was going to inherit a load of money from his grandmother one day and that his grandmother owned a big house on Baker Street in London and that he was going to inherit that and like I said they could just tell that that was probably a load of crap that he had made up to impress them and make himself look like this big successful man who had a load of money. He would apparently lie to people about jobs that he had had. He lied and said that he was a paramedic when he wasn't. He was an ambulance technician. John and Penny were just very suspicious of Jane's new boyfriend, very wary of him and as it would turn out, they were right to be. Their suspicions that he was a compulsive liar turned out to be true because he wasn't just lying to them and his friends and his co-workers, he was also lying to his girlfriend Jane about his relationship status. He was actually leading a double life. It turns out that Jonathan Vass was actually already married when he started his relationship with Jane. He was married to a woman named Joanne and he was also a father. He had two kids with Joanne and Jane had no idea about any of this when she first started seeing him. Jonathan didn't tell her he already had a family for a good while and then when he eventually did tell her, of course she was stunned. She couldn't believe it. But Jonathan told Jane that although he was still married currently, he was planning on divorcing Joanne. He said that the marriage wasn't working. He said that Joanne had apparently cheated on him twice and so he was leaving her. However, that actually turned out to be just another lie he wasn't leaving Joanne. He had no intention of leaving her. He just told Jane that so that she wouldn't break up with him. He wanted to stay married to Joanne and also have his girlfriend Jane on the side. In fact, he wasn't just seeing Joanne and Jane at the same time. Sources state that there were a couple of other women that he was seeing. I read on one article that he was also involved with another woman called Yvonne at one point. And Jane, and I believe Jonathan's wife Joanne too, had absolutely absolutely no idea that he was doing this behind their back and he was able to keep up this deceit for a long time because in early 2008 Jonathan and Jane moved in together. He moved into her house. She lived in a village called Barriford in Lancashire which is not far from her hometown of Nelson. So yeah they took that next big step in their relationship. They started living together and all the while Jane was still none the wiser that he was still with his wife Joanne. To try and hide the fact that he was still with Joanne, Jonathan actually started telling Jane that he was taking on extra night shifts at work but instead he would drive to his wife's house to see her and the kids. But eventually I think Jane did begin to cotton on. She realised that something wasn't right because, I mean, he claimed when he first told Jane about his marriage that he was going to get a divorce and it had been months and months and he hadn't. So she would ask ask him about it, ask him why he hadn't started divorce proceedings yet and he would 
basically just refuse to speak about it, which would constantly lead to arguments between them. Especially because Jane really wanted to start a family of her own. She wanted to marry Jonathan. She wanted to have children with him and settle down. And obviously they couldn't really do all of that until he sorted out his divorce. But every time Jane tried to discuss it with him, he would just brush her off and refuse to talk about it. Obviously we know why, because he was not intending on divorcing his wife. But Jane had no clue what was really going on. She must have felt so confused. But it wasn't just these lies about Jonathan's divorce that had started to put a strain on the relationship because Jonathan also started abusing Jane. I think it started off with more kind of mental and emotional and verbal abuse. So like he would start making just mean comments towards Jane and also about Jane to other people. He would basically slag his girlfriend off to other people behind her back, even to Jane's own parents. Jonathan would tell them about bad things that Jane had supposedly done. He would say, oh, she's done this wrong and she's done that wrong, etc. It was literally like bullying. He was bullying Jane. He was bullying the woman that he was supposedly in love with. But as well as making these sly, nasty comments, Jonathan also began trying to control Jane. He was a very, very jealous man and he was very, very possessive. He saw Jane as his possession. So I imagine he would get annoyed whenever he saw her speaking to other men. He always had to know where she was, what she was doing, who she was with every second of every day. He would even follow her. So for example, apparently one time when she was out for some lunch with some friends from work, he actually followed her without her knowledge, almost like he was trying to catch her out. He wanted to see if she really was with her work friends like she said she would be, or if she had lied about that. Of course she hadn't. And I'm sure one of the main reasons why he was so paranoid was because he was doing the thing that he feared she was doing. He was lying about his whereabouts constantly. As I said, he claimed he was doing night shifts when in reality, he was going to see his wife behind Jane's back. But it wasn't just verbal and emotional and mental abuse that Jane was subjected to at the hands of her boyfriend because Jonathan Vass eventually became physically abusive towards her too. When they would argue, he would turn violent. He would push Jane and slap her and even punch her. And Jane, of course never stood a chance against him because she was this small petite woman and he was this tall well over six foot man he was very muscly he was a bodybuilder he was always going to the gym in fact he would even take steroids to try and build up his muscle even more so Jane could never really defend herself from the physical assault she kept this abuse to herself for the most part initially she didn't tell her family or most of her friends and she would try and cover up her injuries so that people didn't see them so like she would wear a scarf so that she could cover up the bruises around her neck to try and protect Jonathan but she did tell one close friend and work colleague another nurse from the hospital where she worked her name was Tara she told Tara about the abuse she showed her the bruises and Tara had noticed that Jane's entire personality was completely different instead of being her usual happy and bubbly and smiley self, Jane was now just very down all the time. She became quite introverted and withdrawn because of the abuse. Jonathan Vass had changed her. He treated her so, so horrifically that she was now almost like a different person. But despite the abuse, Jane didn't want to leave him. Despite everything he had done, she still loved this man so, so deeply. And as many domestic abuse victims do, she believed that she could change him. She could help him to be a better person. She didn't want to give up on him, so she was determined to make things work. So they stayed together, and in January of 2009, Jane discovered that she was pregnant with Jonathan Vass's baby, with a baby girl, which she was actually over the moon about. Like I mentioned before, she wanted a baby. She'd always wanted a baby. She'd always wanted to start a family of her own, 
and now it was finally happening. And if anything, this baby gave her more hope that Jonathan would actually change. She believed that now that she was pregnant, he would finally start treating her right and he would stop abusing her. When Jane's parents, John and Penny Clough, were told the news about Jane's pregnancy, they were worried. What should have been such an exciting time for them as well, because they were going to be grandparents, was actually the opposite, because they didn't want Jane to have a baby with Jonathan. But it was clear that this was what Jane wanted, and so, of course, they tried their best to be as supportive as they possibly could. They were there for her, and I guess they just hoped for the same as Jane, that this baby, this pregnancy, really would change Jonathan Vass for the better. But, of course, it didn't at all. In fact, the abuse just got even worse, because when she was in her third trimester of pregnancy, around 30 weeks pregnant, Jonathan Vass raped Jane. And this didn't just happen once. He raped her constantly. Over the next month or so, he demanded that she had sex with him repeatedly. And when she would say no, he didn't care. He would just force her. Even when their baby daughter was finally born in October of 2009, the rapes did not stop. When their baby was just six weeks old, Vass raped Jane once again. And this time, he did it right in front of their baby. The baby was in the same room. And it seems as though this was the turning point for Jane. This was the final straw. Now she could see that he was not going to change. If he couldn't stop the abuse for her or their baby, then he was never going to stop. This abuse would never end. And so she decided that enough was enough. She was done. She did not want to be with Vass anymore because she and her daughter were unsafe when they were around him. And so she took her baby and they went to stay with her mum and dad, John and Penny. And it was then when Jane finally opened up to them about what had been going on. She told them that Jonathan had been abusing her. She didn't tell them about the sexual abuse initially. She just told them about the emotional and physical abuse. And of course, they were more than happy for their daughter and grandchild to stay with them. I've got a quote here from Jane's mother, Penny Clough, and she said, We knew things weren't right, but at that point, Jane did not tell us he had raped her. We guessed he was hurting her. She hinted at it, and she'd wear scarves and long sleeves to cover up the bruises. We were desperately worried, but we didn't feel it was our place to put pressure on her. She had to get away from him in her own time. We told her the door was open with us whenever she wanted to come back. So yeah, Jane and the baby began living with John and Penny, which absolutely infuriated Jonathan Vass. He was angry that she had left him and gone to her parents because, as I said before, it was all about control for him. He believed Jane was his, his possession, and so he wanted his possession back. And so just a couple of days after Jane left, he sent a text message to her phone which read, quote, we are staying together regardless of our problems. To which she replied, I love you, Johnny, but I don't feel safe with you anymore. You physically and sexually abused me. You threatened to kill me the other night. I'm sorry, but I'm scared. I hate you touching me because of what comes next. He responded to that message saying, quote, I love you too, but why run to your parents? I'm not going to kill you or batter you. And following these messages, he just continued to harass her. He wouldn't give her space or leave her alone. He was just contacting her constantly, begging her to give him another chance until eventually Jane agreed. Jane said that she would give the relationship another go on one condition, and that was that he got professional help to get his anger issues and violence under control. And he said that he would. In fact, he even told Jane that he had already spoken to his GP about getting some counselling and therapy. However, this was just another lie that he told. He hadn't gone to the doctors. Again, he had no intention of getting help. He just said it to get Jane back. And so when she did go back to him, as you've probably guessed, it wasn't long at all before his violent side emerged again. Just days after they got back together, Vass raped Jane once again. This was the ninth time he had raped her, and now he had completely 
burn his bridges with her. She said that she would give him one more chance and she meant it. So this was it. Once and for all, she was finished with him. She took their daughter, went back to her parents' house and this time she told them the whole truth, the full extent of the abuse that she had endured at the hands of Jonathan Vash. She even told her parents about all the times he'd raped her. And as well as telling her parents, Jane also found the courage to go to the police and report the rapes and domestic abuse. Jane was interviewed at length about each rape, which must have just been so traumatic for her, having to go through each each time she was raped one by one having to relive that it must have been horrific but she did it and following this Jonathan Vass was arrested. He was questioned and he completely denied it basically said that Jane had over exaggerated and that she was twisting it but regardless he was charged with nine counts of rape and I believe four counts of assault too and he was kept in custody whilst he waited for his court proceedings and trial. Now as soon as Vass was assigned his defence team, they immediately applied for him to receive bail so that whilst he waited for his trial, he was free, essentially. He didn't have to be kept locked up in custody. So they applied for bail for him and he was denied. They applied again and the second time he was denied. And so he applied for the third and final time. And unbelievably, this time, the judge, Judge Simon Newell, granted it. He allowed Jonathan Vass to be let out on bail. A man who had been charged with multiple counts of rape and assault was let out on bail despite the danger that he posed. He had terms and conditions when he was let out, obviously the main one being that he was not allowed anywhere near his victim, Jane Clough. He wasn't allowed near her, he wasn't allowed to contact her. But let's be honest, was that really going to stop someone like Jonathan Vass? Of course not. After being let out, Jonathan Vass went to live with his parents because he didn't have his own home anymore. His wife, Joanne, had chucked him out of their house. Clearly, she must have found out about what had been going on. And he didn't have any money to pay for his own place because he was fired from his job at the Blackpool Hospital as an ambulance technician. And as you can imagine, Jane and the whole of her family were absolutely terrified when Vass was let out on bail. They were so scared that he he would break his bail conditions and try to see Jane. They were scared that he would do something to her, get revenge somehow for reporting him to the police. And so as soon as he was let out, Jane basically became a prisoner in her own home. She never left her mum and dad's house. They kept the doors locked at all times. She was on maternity leave still, so she wasn't working, but she didn't really see friends. She just stayed there in the house all day, every day, because she was so frightened of going out and being confronted by Vass. And if she did ever go out, it would never be on her own. Someone would always go with her, which just angers me so much. It's so disappointing that the victim is having to hide from her abuser instead of the abuser being kept in custody and off the street. I cannot imagine the sheer terror that Jane must have experienced, although we are able to get a glimpse of her fears from her diary entries during this time. Jane kept a diary and in mid-January of 2010 she wrote, quote, I'm worried Johnny's going to do something stupid, like try to find me. I don't believe he will just sit back and let a jury find him guilty. He's not going to let them send him to prison and I can't help thinking he's going to get his revenge on me. A couple of weeks after this she wrote another entry which read, oh god, when is this hell going to end? I know some people think I'm overreacting as they keep saying if Johnny was going to break bail he would have done it already but I don't believe that I'm scared towards the end of February 2010 she wrote in her diary again she said what's his plan what's he going to do I don't think we'll get to trial without him doing something to hurt me in some way I don't think we've seen the last of him in early March she wrote quote I've been worrying today about Johnny coming to get me even killing me what what would stop him? Jane was just in this constant state of fear and anxiety for months and months and then in April of 2010 it was time for Jonathan Vass's plea hearing and at the hearing he pleaded 
not guilty to both the rapes and the assaults. He was still denying it, which obviously meant that there was going to have to be a trial. In May of 2010, Jane gave her detailed witness statement to the police so that they had everything they needed to prosecute him, and she planned to testify against him during the trial. She was absolutely determined to do everything she could to get justice for herself and to protect herself and her baby. And it's believed that Jonathan Vass initially probably thought that Jane was bluffing. It's believed that he thought that eventually Jane would give up and drop the charges against him. He didn't think that she would dare go against him in court. However, eventually it started to sink in that actually that wasn't the case, that she was doing this. As I said, she was determined to see this all the way through and go to trial. She wanted Vass to finally be punished for everything he put her through. And when he realised that actually this wasn't just going to go away, that Jane wasn't going to drop this, he was furious because for once he wasn't in control of the situation. Jane was in control now. The days of him controlling her were over. Now Jonathan's trial for rape I believe wasn't going to be happening until later that year and around late 2010. So Jane had a while to wait unfortunately but while she did have to wait she began trying to get her life back on track. Slowly she started to go out again. She would go out with her parents and with friends she was getting ready to go back to work. Again, she would never go anywhere on her own, but she was trying to get out as often as she felt she could. She went to the park with friends, they went on a nice day out to the zoo, just so that she could try to build up her confidence again. And then, towards the end of June 2010, her maternity leave came to an end, and gradually, Jane started going back to work at the hospital, which was incredibly hard for her. She was very, very anxious going back to work. More so actually getting to work every day, driving on her own because she was always fearful that Vass was following her. There was one occasion where she was driving along the motorway and she had to stop her car on the hard shoulder because she started literally having a panic attack. So that was a big hurdle for her to try and overcome. And then when she arrived at work, she would always ask if one of her colleagues could meet her in the car park and walk her inside because she still just always felt so unsafe, still so terrified of what Jonathan Vass might do. And unbeknownst to her, her fears were correct. He did start following her again. When he wasn't in the gym lifting weights, taking steroids, trying to build up his muscle even more, he was out driving around in his car looking for Jane. He was breaking the terms of his bail. He would always go on her Facebook profile to try and figure out where she was. He began stalking her and he was able to get away with it because she never spotted him. He hid very well. And because she never caught him, because she had no idea that he was following her again, naturally over time her confidence slowly started to grow more and more. And so she was starting to do even more things that she hadn't done for so long because she was scared to. For example, going on nights out. She hadn't done that in so long, but on the evening of the 23rd of July 2010, Jane decided to go out with some of her girlfriends on a night out, and they had the most incredible night, and her friends felt like, finally, she was getting back to her old self. She was the happy, bubbly woman that she had always been before Jonathan Vass came into her life. Meanwhile, Jonathan Vass was still seething, still enraged that Jane was not backing down. He believed that his life was going to be ruined after they went to trial and he blamed Jane for it. In his eyes, it wasn't his fault. He was the one who raped Jane repeatedly and assaulted her on multiple occasions, but yet it wasn't his fault. It was her fault that all of this was happening, that he was potentially going to be going to prison as a convicted rapist. And he hated Jane for this. He hated her for ruining his life. In his view, he was going to lose everything because of her, because she went to the police. He was so angry that he decided he was going to ruin her life too. In fact, he decided that he was going to end 
Jane's life. The date was the 25th of July 2010. It was a Sunday and Jane had a night shift at the hospital that evening. So at around 7.30pm she left her home, she left her daughter with her parents, they were going to be looking after her. And then Jane got in her car and she began driving to work. She arrived at the hospital at approximately 8.16pm and she pulled into the car park completely unaware that Jonathan Vass was watching and waiting for her. He had driven to an area near the hospital shortly before and parked his car in a side street and then he used his bike to cycle to the car park where he waited for Jane. After arriving, Jane got out of her car and she began walking to the hospital entrance alone. Now, like I mentioned before, usually one of her colleagues would meet her in the car park and walk her inside. However, by this point, Jane seemed to finally feel confident and comfortable enough to walk in on her own. And so that is exactly what she started doing. She started walking across the car park towards the hospital. It appears as though from CCTV footage, she turned around and went back to her car momentarily when she got about halfway. And it's not known why. Perhaps she just forgot something in her car or maybe she thought that she had forgotten to lock the car doors, who knows? But as she was walking back to the car, that is when Jonathan Vass jumped out on her. He confronted Jane, started shouting at her, demanding that she drop the criminal charges against him, demanding that she drop the rape charges. However, she said no, she wasn't dropping anything. She was going ahead with this. She wasn't going to let him intimidate or threaten her anymore. And when Jane refused to give in, Jonathan Vass pulled out a sharp knife as part of a multi-tool set. According to one article, it was a Leatherman multi-tool with a three-inch blade. He pulled out this blade and using it, he started stabbing Jane over and over again, all over her body. He just stabbed her and stabbed her repeatedly until she was pretty much lifeless on the ground and then he walked away. Now, despite this vicious, vicious attack, despite how many stab wounds she had sustained, Jane was actually still alive at this point. She was severely injured, but she was still alive and conscious. And so when Jonathan walked away, it's believed that she started trying to get back towards her car, probably crawling towards her car. However, she didn't get very far before her attacker came back. Jonathan Vass returned to where Jane was shortly after walking away because he probably realised that she wasn't dead yet. He realised that she was still alive and he didn't want her to be. He wanted her dead and so he went back to finish the job. He walked back up to Jane as she was on the ground bleeding out and using the knife he slit her throat to ensure that she had no chance of survival and then he fled. Minutes after Jonathan walked away, Jane was discovered lying on the ground, I think either by hospital staff or a passerby, and she was quickly rushed into the hospital. And although this was obviously the hospital where she worked, her colleagues, the doctors and nurses, didn't recognise her when she was first rushed in because of her injuries. She was just absolutely covered in blood, so they had no idea that it was her. It wasn't until they looked at her NHS ID badge that she was wearing when they realised that it was Jane. Doctors tried their hardest to save her, they tried to resuscitate her and get her heart going again but sadly there was nothing they could do. She had lost way too much blood and her injuries were just so severe that they were powerless. And so Jane Clough was pronounced dead at just 26 years old. Police described Jane's horrific murder as being one of the most brutal they had ever seen. As I said before, she had stab wounds all over her body. She'd been stabbed more than 70 times and 19 of these stab wounds were in her neck alone. She also had a lot of cuts and stab wounds on her hands and on her arms from where she had tried so, so hard to fight off her attacker and defend herself. But she didn't stand a chance against a knife and a tall, huge bodybuilder of a man. Of course, the police knew as soon as they launched their murder inquiry, they knew who had done this to Jane. They knew that her ex-partner and abuser and rapist, Jonathan Vass, was the killer. 
so immediately they began trying to find him. In addition to this, a couple of hours after Jane was murdered, police officers were also sent to Jane's parents' home to deliver the tragic news to them. And investigators even had a police guard stand outside of the Clough's house because whilst Jonathan Vass was still on the loose, they feared that he might go there and try to attack Jane's parents too, possibly even attack his and Jane's baby daughter. And as it turns out, their fears were correct. That was exactly his plan. It's believed that after killing Jane and fleeing the scene, he obviously couldn't go back to his home because he knew that the police would probably be waiting for him there. So he was constantly on the move, never staying in the same place for very long. And then early the next morning, I believe around like 5 to 6 a.m., he began driving to the Clough's address. And with him in his car, he had two full cans of petrol. He intended to set their house on fire and in doing so, killing both Jane's parents and also his own child and perhaps himself as well. It's theorised that he may have planned to drive into the house whilst the car was on fire so that he died too and then he wouldn't have to face the consequences of his actions. However, thankfully that did not happen because as soon as Vass pulled up near the home around around 7.30 a.m. he was spotted by the officers guarding the house and he was immediately apprehended via the use of a taser gun and he was arrested. Apparently he was very very angry when he was arrested and not just because he had been caught but also because there were some female police officers who were involved in his arrest. He was disgusted that there were female police officers present when he was arrested telling him what to do because he was was a vile, vile man who enjoyed abusing women, who had always tried to control the women in his life, and now he had female officers arresting him, and he really did not like that. Following his arrest, he was taken into custody, and he was questioned about Jane's murder, and I don't believe he denied it at all. I think he admitted that he was the killer, but he never showed any remorse. He didn't feel at all guilty for what he had done. He was happy with himself he was happy that she was dead. He was charged with murder and in October of 2010 at Preston Crown Court he pleaded guilty to the charge. During his court proceedings Jane's diary entries were read out, the diary entries where she talked about her fears that Jonathan wasn't just going to back off and face the consequences of his actions, her fears that he was going to return and kill her and then just a week after he pleaded guilty Jonathan Vass was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 30 years and with that he was sent off to jail. Now very very disappointingly the charges of rape against Vass never actually went ahead. The judge decided to just let the outstanding rape charges remain on file instead of actually prosecuting him for them so he was just convicted of Jane's murder which Jane's family was so so upset about because it was almost like he was only being punished for one crime when he committed so so many more. He didn't just kill Jane, he raped her nine times before that, so they of course felt that he should also be convicted of those because otherwise Jane isn't getting all the justice she deserves. Not just that, but also they felt it was unfair because if Jonathan Vass was let out after 30 years, which he probably won't be, but he could be, that's when he can apply for parole, so if he is let out in 30 years without the rape convictions, he won't be considered did a sex offender. He won't be on the sex offenders register, which could massively endanger other women because he won't be given the same restrictions and conditions that people on the register have. So yeah, as I said, very, very frustrating that he wasn't going to be convicted of those. But apparently, although the rape charges never went ahead on their own, the judge did take the rapes into account when sentencing Vass, and that's why he got a pretty high 
high tariff of 30 years. You know, some convicted murderers can get life in prison with a minimum of 15 years, but Jonathan Vass got 30 because of the crimes that he committed against Jane before her murder. In the aftermath of this case, Jane's parents, John and Penny Clough, started a campaign called Justice for Jane because they believed that something needed to be done. There needed to be a change when it came to bail laws in the UK because they were the reason why Jonathan Vass was able to commit Jane's murder in the first place. If you remember, when he committed the murder, he was out on bail whilst he awaited his trial for the rape charges and he applied for bail three times and the third time his request was granted by Judge Simon Newell. And if that hadn't happened, if he was denied bail and kept in custody, Jane would still be alive today. He wouldn't have been free to kill her if that decision had not been made. And John and Penny were determined to not let that happen to any other victim of domestic abuse and rape. They wanted to change the law to make it safer for other victims. They worked so incredibly hard to change bail laws. As I said, they had a campaign, they ran an online petition which collected thousands and thousands of signatures. And in May of 2012, finally their hard work paid off when a new law named after Jane was introduced. It was called Jane's Law and Jane's Law now means that victims are allowed to challenge an appeal against a judge's decision to let their alleged abuser out on bail. This is the kind of law that could have saved Jane had it been around when she was going through all the court proceedings for the abuse that she had endured. And I have no doubt at all that it has absolutely saved other victims of rape and abuse and that's all thanks to Jane and her mum and dad John and Penny. In addition to the changes in the law they campaigned for there to be a stalking register introduced in the UK so that serial stalkers could be constantly tracked and monitored keeping victims of stalking safe and John and Penny also founded a recovery refuge group called Jane's Place which provides support and accommodation for victims of domestic abuse. I believe in the northwest of England who have fled from dangerous home environments. I will leave a link to the Jane's Place website in the description box. And because of all the incredible work they have done, both John and Penny were awarded an MBA for their services to victims of domestic abuse. Now just to give you an update on Jane's daughter, the child that she had with Jonathan Vass, she was eventually adopted by Jane's sister Louise, which according to news articles was a very traumatic ordeal for the Clough family in itself because apparently Jonathan Vass objected to the adoption, which unbelievably he had a right to do because of a family court ruling. Because he was named on the birth certificate, he was able to object to this adoption from behind bars. So this whole thing had to go to family court and Vass was even allowed to essentially cross-examine Jane's sister Louise via video link during the court proceedings, which again is just unbelievable. I cannot believe he was even allowed to object to the adoption, let alone allowed to question the sister of the woman he murdered. It's disgusting. But as far as I'm aware, Louise was able to go ahead and adopt Jane's daughter in the end. I couldn't find any information that suggested otherwise, so I believe she is being raised by Jane's sister. And that concludes this case. That is the utterly heartbreaking case of Jane Clough. A very, very heavy case. A shocking, shocking murder. And again, a preventable one, really. Like I just said a few minutes ago, if he hadn't been let out on bail, he wouldn't have been free to kill Jane. It's so, so disappointing that the safety of the victim was not the top priority here and that he was able to just walk the streets and be free whilst he waited for his court proceedings. But that is it for this video. Please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I always want to hear what you guys have to say. Also feel free to let me know your case suggestions in the comments too. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you have haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!